I'm Cindy Kelly, and it is Thursday, November 6th. I am in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and I have with me Mr. Tom Forkner. And my first question to him is to tell me his name and spell it, please. Yeah, how about T-O-M, Tom? F-O-R-K-N-E-R. Thank you. Um, so let's start at the beginning. Maybe you could tell us um, your birthday when you were born, and then something about your childhood. Well, I was born June 14, 1918, in, <coughs> in South Georgia, but I grew up in Avondale, right out of Atlanta. And <coughs> what now is a four-lane highway was a dirt road then. So Avondale just developed, and that's where I grew up. So uh, they had... Uh, well, when I was going through school, I got out of high school a little early. Then I went to junior college and uh, got out of there by the, just a kind of guesswork. Then I went to night law school and had a big accident, and I passed the bar. So I, I was practicing law at 23 years old. Then the draft came along, and in biggest DeKalb County is, that's one of the big counties in, around Atlanta, and I drew number seven. If it had been a lottery, I'd have been in great shape. But I went from practicing law to uh, peeling potatoes at Fort Mac in about two weeks. So then <coughs> they've transferred me. I, I had a chance to go to OCS, but you had to sign up for three years. And if you stayed in just as a draftee, you served one year and you was out. So I took the one year. Well, I was in seven months, and then the war broke out. So three and a half years later, I got out. But I took my commission just so that I could come out with having had a commission rather than as a private. But in the meantime, I was sent into a uh, Armed uh, CIC, uh, County Intelligence, and started off doing undercover work. And I spent oh, a couple of years doing undercover work. Anything from a painter to electrician to a major to just all kind of stuff. And uh, then I had a lot of work that required some top secret stuff. And then when I got my commission, we were sent to uh, Camp Ritchie, Maryland, and that was an overseas pool. Everybody there was headed overseas. It just a matter where you're going to the far east of Europe. Everybody wanted to go to Europe. So uh, I think it's around four or five hundred uh, people there. And when they announced, they posted uh, where everybody would be, and I looked on it and. There were 17 names on the side, and my name is one of those that didn't go. And the only instructions I had, I had been interviewed incidentally during the time I was there. And I'd ask questions, he'd say, I can't tell you that. So I said, well, let me put it this way. If what you're looking for when I fit, let's go at it. So that's as far as I knew. But then I got these instructions to re report to Knoxville, Tennessee. I didn't have any idea what I was doing. And uh, somebody met me when I got off the train, took me to Oak Ridge, and that's the first time I knew I was at, at Oak Ridge. So uh, that's when they gave me the job, along with a lot of others, I don't know how many, to haul in the Merged the product from uh, Oak Ridge to Mexico, and it was a 53-hour drive nonstop. Two people to the automobile trail car, and two people on the truck was hauling the merchandise. So 53 hours switching driving is a long way. But we avoided every city, went around every, they had a special route that I had nothing to do with. They knew the route when they started. 
And we were coming back, do anything you wanted to. So <clears throat> one day I was bragging about all my accomplishments in track, and I had a pretty good record. And one of the fellows I ride along said, Lieutenant, I can outrun you. I said, I don't think so. I said, stop the truck. We was on a little country road. We took off and he outran me. <laughs> <laughs> that That's ended great. all my talking. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> uh, my, my boss was Captain Brown. And uh, we had close communication with this civilian group. Then uh, that's where my wife worked. At that time, I just met her, and that was it. But uh, I was 27 then. And when I met Martha, three months later, well, the first thing was in a uh, mock wedding. And they had a fashion show. And she was reported to be the prettiest girl at Oak Ridge. And I looked over the group of them in there, and I said, you know, if I can be with that girl right over there, I'll be in this show. So <clears throat> they went over to her, and all I could see that class. So we got married in a mock wedding, and 90 days later, we got married for real. That's great. We got, oh, I guess about 70 years behind us now. What was her ma what was her maiden name? Martha Bishop. She's from Gainesville, Florida. But she's got a memory problem now, and when she tells about what she did up there, she was secretary to one of the top fellows there. But she was assistant to Oppenheimer. That's the way she tells it. <laughs> <laughs> So but was your job, um, was it considered counter-espionage, or was that, that was just what you did in the Army before you got into the Manhattan Project? No, I did undercover work before I got in there, and that, and that, that took in anything. And one of my favorite was, if a post was secure, my job was to crash the post. And, uh, but not slip in, do by some maneuver, go in legally. And uh, so I had to make up anything I could to get in, check the security, such as you can buy all the equipment and you buy clothes downtown. And uh, I took a picture of an officer, put it and pasted it onto identification, pulled up to the door, threw it to him. I said, why haven't they brought my ammunition? He said, sir, I don't know anything about that. I said, where? <coughs> <coughs> Where's the man that knows? He says, that building right over there. And so I just went right on through. <laughs> That's very cool. <coughs> and uh, I did that for several years, and then that's when, when I got my commission and ended up at Oak Ridge. Well, <coughs> when I got through that one day, and I got called in from Oak Ridge to transfer me to New York. And uh, I said, well, you got 30 people that are more qualified than I am. Why would I want to go there? And this major said, you go where you're told to go. So <laughs> I said, yes, sir. So I went to New York, and I was security officer for the Manhattan District. And <clears throat> Funny thing, if people would call about uranium, call Washington, where they were really talking to uh, was where we were. And they thought they were talking to Washington, but they were talking to New York. <laughs> That's funny. But uh, the whole thing just went through. Just nobody that I was aware of ever said anything at any time that they should not have done. And I had a <coughs> fellow at Oak Ridge I was real friendly with. We had a desk side by side. One night he asked me, said, let's go down to Oak Ridge tonight. And I'm into uh, Knoxville. 
and I started, we went down had a good time. He was kind of quiet like that night. Next morning I got in, his desk was cleaned off. He was gone. I've never seen or heard from him since. That's how secret it was. He, he had been transferred to some place. But um, even, even Martha and I, we, didn't, we didn't, never talked about it one time until after it was announced. The only instructions I ever had when we left, I was off, the only officer on that, so I was in charge of the, the trip, going and coming. And the only orders I had was, I said, lose it and you'd better be dead. So we had a machine gun right overhead and uh, instructions were just don't lose it. So. <clears throat> Did you stop on the road uh, ever, I mean, to get uh, something to eat? I was a trail car and I never knew when they were gonna stop. They bypassed all cities. They had a route picked up that I, that I just followed the truck, and uh, <clears throat> it was special built, well balanced. It could take a curve. It was just hard to keep up with him when you get to the, the mountain area. But <clears throat> one of the funny things, at that time we had communication between the, t the car and the truck, and he'd round the curve, and <clears throat> he says, "It's all clear ahead. Come on around, blind curve." And the people watching me go around a blind curve on a mountain area, thinking about the nut, doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> so, but I, when they tell me it's all clear, come on around. <laughs> so I'd pass an automobile on a curve, it was just absolutely blind on the other side. <laughs> <coughs> Did you have a deadline that you had to deliver this material with, sir? a pressure to get to New Mexico quickly? No, it was <clears throat> a non-stop, except for gas and to eat. And if we, if we ever ate, we had to have the, the truck, they, they had the places picked out, I didn't have anything to do with that, where you could park right up against the window and then go inside and had your eyes on the product all the time. You know, they had all these things figured out because I wasn't the first one to go. And, uh, but <clears throat> you, you just never, never let it out of your sight. But it was, that 53 hours was pretty grinding. And I learned real early that I better take the steering wheel after midnight because the other fellow I was with couldn't, he couldn't stay awake. <laughs> wow. Did you know the other fellow before you were assigned this trip? No. And I don't know how many other trips were similar to mine. The only thing I knew, I had one route, and then I'd go there to whoever was in it, and the scientist, I, I don't guess we talked a dozen times, that maybe at lunch. And then come back, <coughs> uh, we that was a pretty relaxed trip. It stopped wherever you wanted to. But if I remember now, I didn't know who was going to be on the trip or who they were or anything. And each trip was different with different people. Yes, it was. And one time I took it by myself. I don't know what I was carrying, but <clears throat> I had it in my automobile. I was the only one, but I don't know what, what it was. It was kind of about about that size, and uh, I took a different route, <clears throat> but I had no communication with anybody. And when I left Oak Ridge, they didn't know where I was until I reported down there. And then I understood, I had a bunch of officers at Oak Ridge real nervous, where'd that fella go? <laughs> There was, um, that must have been strange to suddenly be the only one. You had no one to spell you on the driving. So well, how did you do this? I spent the night. Oh. I stopped. That was not nonstop. Did you take the package uh, 
in the motel with you, or how did that work? I think I had an automobile. I don't think I left the car. Oh. You just slept in the automobile. Uh, did you have uh, a gun then? Did, uh, what? did you have a gun? Yeah, I sure did. Yeah. And uh, that took a different route from the one over the mountain. And I was just out of sight for till I got it down there. But I was told there were some nervous people up at Oak Ridge when they couldn't find me. I'm sure it was such so valuable. <coughs> wow. But it was quite an experience, but I, I, I didn't think too much at the time about it. It was just a job I was doing in the service. When did you realize what it was you might have been carrying? Well, they told me what it was. But when I realized what it really was is when it exploded the first one. I mean, they, they uh, we were talking about a while ago, you didn't hear, uh, talk about these blockbusters that, blo that really just tap one block. And, and the report was they'd do about six, seven blocks, but they wouldn't do it. And so I just figured this bomb was over-exaggerated. And But <coughs> truth of matter, it was under-exaggerated. And I understand today they've got them as more powerful than that. Oh, yes. Much, much more powerful. Yeah. Right. right. Wow. Um, now, when you were uh, living in Oak Ridge, did you live in the barracks or? In the barracks. Okay. <coughs> Funny thing, I had come out of this kill to be killed school at Camp Ritchie, and uh, you'd fight a tiger when you got out of that place. Just they just really brainwash you into just being a real fighter. So <clears throat> when I got to Oak Ridge in the barracks, I thought I'd gone to heaven. My wife, that I didn't know at that time, came from from a sorority at FSU in Florida. <laughs> and she thought she'd gone to hell. <laughs> so we were in the same condition, but where we came from, the where we ended up was just uh, made the difference. Okay. So uh, after you, um, are <coughs> so we heard how you met her. Um, do you remember some of the things you did together while you were courting? Or fun well, <coughs> when I met her. We did, uh, it got set up for the mock wedding, had a mock wedding. Then I had a trip and I had to go deliver a bomb so somebody else took my place in the mock wedding. And so when I got back in town and was having a regular show, then that's the first time I'd been in it. So I went with her in there. And <clears throat> after it's over, I told her that, uh, I said, Ben, we officially married. Let's go down to Knoxville and have dinner. She said, all right. And on the way down there, and I hadn't known her, oh, just a few days. I said, I want to tell you something I know now that I'll tell you later on, that I knew I was going to marry that gal. And 90 days later, I did. So what did you say, or what did she say when you said I? She, <coughs> she didn't pay attention. She doesn't even remember that. <laughs> <laughs> did you get married in Oak Ridge? Uh, no. <coughs> she said she had one promise she'd made her mother, that she was going to be married in Gainesville, Florida, in the Baptist church with a regular wedding. So I had to drive from New York to Gainesville, Florida, and uh, which I did. And so it, it was quite a wedding too. It was a real, real fine wedding. Big crowd, and uh, she was, <coughs> as I say, a real, real good-looking gal. And she had a bunch of fellas down there. It was after her pretty strong. 
So uh, I just kind of won out on that one. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Were your parents able to come? Uh, my. Yes, they did. Yeah, and my brother-in-law was, and brother-in-law, uh, he was best man. So. Uh, Let's see, my mother, dad, and my brother-in-law and my sister, that's four of them, that's the best I remember now. Uh -huh. And then did you have to uh, go right back to New York, or were you able to take a honeymoon? No, I had to get back to New York, but I had just been commissioned shortly before that, and I didn't know the difference between a private and a <coughs> uh, officer. A private, the day of return is the day of duty. And for an officer, the day of return is really, you got an extra day in that, a day of leave. So I drove all night going back to get back on time, and my secretary said, you're not due back till tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> How long did that drive take? Well, from <coughs> Gainesville, Florida to New York, we spent the night in Kentucky, and I drove through Philadelphia right in the middle of the night, and uh, it's two days. So was Martha with you? Oh, yeah. A, a, a speedy honeymoon. Yeah. <laughs> Just drove through the night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd have, I had an apartment. <coughs> that uh, Lexington and 79th, which is a good area of, of Manhattan, and it's $75 that I had to pay. But I wasn't making but 210 and uh, I was told recently that that same identical apartment is still there, but the rent's $1,500 a month. That's how much difference. Yeah, wow, 75 to 1500 Wow. So what were your, um, do you remember where you worked when you were the, you know, assigned there? You were the, tell us uh, about it. <clears throat> 79th and Lexington, and I got on the train and came down, I think 28th. But you've, you've heard of the little church around the corner in Manhattan? Well, my building was right where I could look right down on top of it. So I think that's 29th, I'm not sure about that. But it was, I know it was, it was right on top of the little church around the corner, whatever, where everybody wanted to get married. Well, you know, the funny thing, is, is you, in New York, they came up there one day and said, would you like to see a computer? I said, yeah. So they went down to the university and they had a room Oh, about three times the size of this room. And a piece of machinery all the way across, these were big wheels, and they said, you can put a problem in that th on this end, and in five minutes it'd come out down, answer to come out the other end. And <clears throat> it, like, it was like several, several millions of dollars project. Today, you got this little $10 hand thing to do 40 times what that'll do. <laughs> Great. Wow. And, and you remember this, seeing this during the war? Remember what? Did you see this while you were? Yeah, when I was in Oak Ridge. Yeah. I mean, in New York. Yeah, right. Yeah. What was that Bell Labs, do you think? It was at the college. I, uh, no, that's all I remember. That yeah. Somebody drove me there, and, and I watched, just watched them run this one problem through it. All these wheels turning, and uh, yeah. the, 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 some answer would come out the other end. That's crazy. Wow. Um, I well, read something the other day that said, <clears throat> of all the technology we have today, uh, 50 years from now, only 1% of it will be used. 99% new technology. 
It's all it's become obsolete over time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah things change fast. I don't know who figured that percentage out, but <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> So, did you know anyone who was involved in the so-called British mission? There were about 20 um, British scientists who ended up in the Woolworth building, which was probably not far, but not the same building. No, the only, only connection I had when we took over Germany, uh, Russia and the United States split stuff at the head. And the <coughs> stuff that the United States had was coming back to New York. Well, I was New York security officer. So <coughs> the ship had already docked when I got down there. And one of the officers came off and he said, Lieutenant, I got a deal for you. I said, what is it? He said, we've got all this stuff <coughs> from, uh, from uh, Germany. And but in addition, we have 20 cases of the finest wine that was buried during the war. And <clears throat> I'd like to take them off. And if you let me take them off, I'll give you one case. I said, well, I don't see anything wrong with that, so I'll do it. And that was the finest wine I've ever seen. <laughs> good. Uh, what happened to the rest of it? That was his. That was his. <laughs> Not a bad deal for him. Yeah. Huh. That's great. So how long did you, um, do you remember meeting General Groves or, or any, anything about? I met him twice. Uh, <clears throat> he wanted something that they didn't have in, in Washington. But they did have it in New York. So he called up there, and I got to assume what happened. Uh, <clears throat> he said, the next person coming down, bring me some. And so the whoever the CO was there passed it down to the colonel and to the major, and I was the lowest ranking officer there. So it ended up I had that trip to make. So I <clears throat> got on the train, had to some kind of oil that it was. It wasn't a big package, but it was a kind of a handful. And I went through two or three offices to get to his office. And walked in there, he was behind his desk. <coughs> and I announced what I had and told him. He said, set in the corner over there. Yes, sir, I sat in the corner. That was the only time I'd seen him. <laughs> and I'm out and gone again. And another time, <clears throat> I was at Oak Ridge, and I had some kind, they gave me an envelope, said take this to Chicago, I believe it was, and uh, I took it there, and then on, we had to carry $20 in our pocket at all times, so we, trips would come up unexpected. So <clears throat> I took the trip up to Chicago, they said this got to go to New Mexico. So they put me on a plane, New Mexico I went. Then they take this back up to Washington. <coughs> so now I'm gone about two, three days in the same clothes, same everything. And he was at the airport fussing because they was holding him up. He had a flight he wanted, but he was being held up. I said, well, I've got an envelope here that's supposed to go to you. And he said, well, let me see what it is. He ripped it open, read it a little bit. <clears throat> he said, why did they send me this mess? Said, take that to my office. <laughs> that was only <laughs> That was only two times I ever met him. <laughs> they didn't uh, waste any time. No chit chat there. <laughs> And you have no idea what the content was? No, I never did. I, I had no idea. It was sealed. Yeah. And my only thing was to get it there. And when he got it, did he hand it back to you after he opened it? Yeah, mm -hmm. hand it back to me. Yeah. He stuck it back in the envelope, hand it back to you, said, take this to my office. But 
And I never pulled it out. I just took it like it was. So then you went back to Washington. <coughs> At that point, you're in Los Alamos? Or you're in no, I'm back in Washington, I guess. I, maybe I went from, from uh, Mexico back to Washington, where he was. I see. And when I got off the plane, walked up, he was standing there. You know, I have read a lot of accounts of people traveling, and most times people took the train. You In traveling? Yeah, when they traveled. I, I don't know many stories of people taking a plane. They didn't, it wasn't allowed on a plane. Pardon? It was not, the, 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 the product itself was not allowed yeah, on the plane. Yeah, not on the plane. But you would <coughs> travel by plane. You said you did. But all I have is an envelope. Right, right. I didn't travel by plane if I had it. Yeah, like, oh, no, no, I, I understand that. That had to stay on I the ground. I understand that. And it never went through a city. It always bypassed all cities. Yeah. So was uh, Martha able to get a job in, in uh, New York City when you moved up there together? No, she, was, she just stayed at the, at the apartment. <coughs> if you try to live in New York on $210 a month, it's, it's a job. We, we knew everything that, in New York that was free. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, so do you ever hear from or, or keep in touch with anybody you knew, uh, you worked with? Not the first one. Jim Wright was Martha's boss, and he lived in Knoxville, and when after the war was over, when he was civilian, everybody in his office was civilian. And <coughs> we was, that is has stopped by to visit his house as we were going through Knoxville. He said, Tom, I'm going to tell you something, but don't tell Martha until you're out of town. And I said, okay, what is it? He said, I was a chicken colonel undercover all the time I used Oak Ridge. And I thought that my Captain Brown was his boss, and it was just the reverse. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Now whether he was lying to me or not, I'll never know. But he said he, and he had a, a good responsible job and a lot of people under him, so it, well, it would fit. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Can you talk a little bit about um, how many people were in uh, security, either you know, watching other people? What? <clears throat> that I don't know. I was in K-25, and uh, in his office, he had, oh, I'd say 15, 20 people there that had a little desk doing whatever they were doing. And in my office, there was about four or five of us, and, and uh, then they had an office next door that you didn't know what they were doing. And I really didn't even know what the fellow next to me was doing. So it was it was tight. So were you on the the third floor? Did it where there was an operational floor? Did you say you you were at K twenty five? Yeah, not, I, don't, I don't remember where that, what floor I was on. Yeah, you, maybe I you don't remember. I don't remember using an elevator though. Yeah, it it could be K twenty five actually refers to a hundred different buildings because it was a huge. Yeah, complex. yeah, I know okay, that. Okay, so you could have been <coughs> in some some office. Yeah. And I knew it was big, but I didn't know the size of it. The plant. Just, yeah. Just wasn't anybody talked about anything except what they did. So uh, I couldn't help anybody if they took me to Europe, or Germany, or wherever. Did you find out more about the project uh, in your second assignment when you were working in Manhattan? Uh, no. It <coughs> they had uh, two or three fellows. One fellow, uh, he was in charge of uranium. Anybody in the United States find uranium, they'd call what they thought was Washington, but the accident was talking to him in New York. 
and he was in charge of that. Another was in there's about six or eight departments there, and each one of them had the job they were doing. And one of them was a West Point officer, full colonel. And I asked him one day, I said, Do you enjoy yourself going through West Point? He said, You don't go there and enjoy yourself, you just try to go there to get out. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. I wonder if he knew Groves there. I guess. Well, he he probably did. But I never, I don't know if Groves ever got to New York. He was strictly Washington. I think he started there, and then moved down. You think so? Yeah. Well, he he was in Washington when I was in New mm -hmm. York. Do you remember his office? I remember going through it. Yeah. And I spent the night there. And at that time, I was not married. But I was I was engaged. But <clears throat> the fellows in the office were kind of making up a little party that night. And <clears throat> I got partnered up with Grove's secretary. And she was kind of real nice conversation and we just had a good conversation no no courting no nothing just talking and enjoying one another and uh, I was told that when the promotions came through the first lieutenant out of 600 names my name was first I said well now what good would that do anybody that said means that when you get your three years in go for captain you're the first one on the list so she did take care of me there. <laughs> Gene O'Leary. At least that was one of his his secretaries, Gene O'Leary. I don't know if you, that name sounds familiar. No, I don't familiar. remember her name, but yeah. all we did just had a good time talking. Yeah, she's, uh, reportedly <coughs> she knew everything that Groves knew, and she was the only person who knew you know, nearly as much as he knew. Well, she was sharp, I can tell you, I know that. And, and very pleasant gal. So what did you do after the war? Went back to the real estate office. When I was at, had been <clears throat> and I was going back in law practice. But the first thing I did, I uh, took a case in Decatur. And <clears throat> after three years, I had forgotten all my, if you go into the, court, you better remember all your things you can object to, the grounds you object to it, and they just tore me up. So I said I'd never go back in the courtroom again, and I didn't. And shortly after that, <coughs> my daddy died, so I took over the real estate company. And uh, then it went from there on to the Waffle House, and where we are now. Now, where I am now, I still have an office. They just tell me to stay out of the way. You want to talk a little bit about um, your partnership with Joe with Rogers? With Joe? Mm. <coughs> I imagine we have a pretty good record. Joe and I were good friends before Waffle House days. Lived just two doors apart. And then we decided to start this little Waffle House. And we started number one, and his boss, he worked for a toddle house. And his boss found out he was involved with Waffle House, so he sold out to me. And under the conditions that he'd kind of send me some help and show me how to run it. So for five years, I had it by myself. And I did not like the food business. It just too much technical, too much to it, really. And uh, so after five years, we had five stores open. And I was 100% owner, 100% operator and everything. He just come through town and advised me. So I offered him half interest. And bottom of the line, we had $1,700 after all things were paid. I said, I give you half interest and a salary equal to what's right there. He said, I'd do that. So he came back under those conditions, 
In the first month, he absorbed his salary. Now, not the first year, the first month. He absorbed his salary in double what I was putting at the bottom line. <laughs> wow. That comes on knowing what you're doing and not knowing. But <clears throat> we had office there, little offices. Well, we used a door panel, a do, door for the desk, and you could get two people in there at one time, and that was it. And that's that my, was my office for five years. But then when we finally got an office, we made an office side by side. And uh, <clears throat> Joanne was secretary. She'd been working for me for 40 years. And Joe and I had an office side by side then, and his office is next door right now. He can't come to the office because he's, he's physically disabled. But we've got, well, 55, let's see, however have a long waffle is, we still get along good. But we had one thing rule between us. Object any time you want to, but just don't be ugly about it. And the proper terminology was disagree on anything you want to, but don't be disagreeable. So we've been friends now a long, long time, since back in the late 40s. And I guess with two fellas in the business, neither one of us have any ownership in the old Joe Jr. is a major stockholder now. What a wonderful story. <clears throat> yeah. It's been a good ride all the way through. How did your um, Manhattan Project experience, you think, influence the way you um, lived the rest of your life? Uh, <clears throat> I think my undercover work had more influence than anything. No Ridge, I did a good job. I never felt like I did a good job at New York, but I got through with it. But I didn't go into enough details in each department to know what they were doing. So uh, I'd say I did a good job at Oak Ridge, and I got a passable job in New York. Do you? Uh when you, can you describe your job at Oak Ridge a little bit more? Uh, well, the main thing was transportation on the trip. Now, exactly what I did while I was in Oak Ridge and when I wasn't out of town, I don't think anything real outstanding about it. Um, no, nothing particular there. Now, in New York, I had a security job. I had about the oh, old 15, 20 uh, guards and people around I was responsible for and in different departments. And that's when I, thinking about it, <coughs> didn't do the job I could have done. That, uh, going to each department to find out what they're doing. And they turned out all right, but I should have known more about each department than I did. Oh, they probably wouldn't have told you. <laughs> you think about that. Well, I, I, I knew them well enough to get involved a bit. Yeah. And being a security officer, they, they probably would have told me. Hard to know. <laughs> Hard to know. You might have found your desk empty and you're hauled off someplace else if you get to know too That's much. That's right. right? <laughs> yeah. Huh. Interesting. Very interesting. So when you learned that the result of this huge project was to make an atomic bomb, what was your, what was your reaction? I didn't think it was as powerful as it was. And I thought it was going to be powerful, but I had no idea it'd be as powerful. And I'm real sure in my own mind 
There's a lot of others thought the same thing until they exploded that first one. And the reaction I got from the people close to it, it was more powerful than they even thought it was going to be. So were you in New York when, the, that, that, you must have been in Manhattan I when was. the war came yeah. to an end. Yeah. Do you remember um, the mood of the office? Was everybody uh, celebrating the end of the war? Were they... How did they react to that news? Well, 90% was just happy to be, to get word they were going to get out. <laughs> and that was, I was one of them. I wasn't waiting on anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but they had <coughs> guns that, from the various departments and everything. They had a place where the, they were getting rid of all the weapons they had. And the officers got the first choice. So I went down, picked out a couple of shotguns, and Maybe, let's, for example, just say they're worth maybe $300. Now, I got them for about 50 bucks. So I got two of real fine shotguns. And, uh, but they started getting rid of stuff just about as fast as you could. So when were you finally discharged or let go? Uh, it wasn't long after that. Then um, when I got out, I, I, I had a, the latest Buick when I went in, uh, but in New York I kept getting a parking tickets for being overnight and being kind of stupid. I was in charge of the parking lot in the building I was in as, uh, for security, and I could have made a deal there, and it didn't occur to me until after I sold it. But then it, <coughs> we got out in January, and I bought a Ford, and we decided we'd go see how far north we'd go. So we went on up into Canada, and then crossed over to uh, right, right straight across the United States, and then headed due south. And I wasn't in a hurry to get home then, but we was out. <laughs> so what was the country like? In New York. Well. You know, you're you're driving right after the war. What did <coughs> the country seem? What impression did you have driving? Well, I had two two things. Um, in New York, it's congested, and I didn't go but just a few miles until I got to the northern part of New York, and it's just like in the country. That's the first thing that impressed me. And the second thing, we'd stop in these cities, and snow was just in the mind, uh, safety instructions where where we were stop at three o'clock. Don't go beyond three in the afternoon to have your place you're gonna stay. And one day we didn't cover but 15 miles and didn't like where we were, so turned around and went back where we started from. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we spent the night at one of the senators Sterling from Maine and, and when he had a place where he could spend the night, we stayed there. And uh, then we just cut across, right straight across the United States. And they had a <coughs> big ice pond out there that was frozen over in Vermont, I believe it was. And I asked a fellow, I said, you got any skates around there? I've been thinking about skating. He said, yeah, we got some. I said, could I borrow one pair? And so I got on them, and I have never been on skates in my life. I'm off out there watching me. And I'd skate along, and I said, I'm going to put the brakes on like they're doing the show. And I'd yeah. put that, and then I'd fall. And I'd get up, and I'd do it, and I'd fall. And the next morning, I, well, that afternoon, I looked up, and there windows, uh, somebody in the other window around there. And the mechanic had kept my car. He said, Are you that fool on that skate, Chester? <laughs> I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess where the most, to me, was the most interesting, I'd spent about two years doing undercover work, and that was before Oak Ridge. And I had one case where I had this German, and his platoon was being shipped overseas, and they didn't want him in there. 
So <clears throat> he was a sorry soldier in the Army. And my colonel, when I was undercover, said, go down and stay with this fellow, make friends with him, and act, put your act on and be the sorry soldier in the Army. In other words, go down and act natural. So, <laughs> just, so I went down and made friends with him, and we deserted. So went to Atlanta, and then from there we went to New York and stayed, he lived in New York, and I stayed up there, and there's a book, The House on 92nd Street, and uh, where the, in Germ, kind of like Germantown, and I was undercover with Beck, and I had to remember who I really am, who he thought I was, and we made up another name in New York who would be up there. So I'm down in the middle of Germantown. I got to remember who I am, who he thought I was, and who we said we was going to be every time I opened my mouth. Now that's, that's tricky. <laughs> wow. So what happened? Did you decide he was a spy on trust? No, or? the only thing he wanted was get out of the army. And he wanted to go to Germany, but he didn't want to fight. He just wanted to get out of the United States. And But he's perfectly harmless, but he just was a useless individual. So uh, finally I found out that he had no idea of any sabotage, anything like that. So I re reported him. They had a trial, and he got 10 years uh, sentence. And they asked him about the fellow he was with. And he said, well, no, I don't know about that. said, when we got out, we crossed over into Alabama. And said, I got on the bus and went one way. He went the other way and said, I haven't seen him since. And we were together for three months, but he never said a month. They, the other way, we just split, and that was it. But they, he got 10 years. And when the war ended, he got out before I did. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. That's a good story. <laughs> wow. How many people, do you have any idea how many people were in um, undercover work? Oh, um, now there's about seven, eight in that department, but uh, what they did, I didn't know, but um, I was reported to be the number one undercover man. I did just one right after another. And then, uh, but I, I never did anything great. I, I could find out things when they reported something. Uh, it wasn't happening like, but they just wanted, for example, a lot of crash, plane crashes down in, or in uh, Orlando, Florida, where they're training and they're moving these fellas from a single engine to a double engine and then to four, four, four engine planes. And they have them take off and land, take off and land. So <clears throat> I was a mechanic and I asked the officer one day if I could have a ride. He said, yeah, just be back there. So I got on there. And these fellows were killing themselves down there, just they're moving up so fast so to get them overseas. And that plane hit the ground, boom, bounced about four or five times. The fellows over there, and, but the instructor didn't seem to mind, but it scared me to death. And I went up to him. I said, now, Lieutenant, I say what? You can have me court-martialed if you want to but I'm down here on a special assignment, and I'm not who you think I am, but I want off this plane. And I said, you can report me if you want to. <laughs> he, he said, no, I said, next time, just jump off in a hurry. But they were just, so I went back and made a report. They were just moving people through the flight uh, so fast they were just killing them. And, and things like that was, real fun for me. 
But I didn't like that one. Do you know if they uh, followed up on your report? Well, <clears throat> the only follow-up they're having, like at uh, Fort Benning, they were having a lot of cars that have parades and a lot of cars breaking down and a lot of them is, that are in the shop too long and and they sent me down there to find out why so many automobiles and trucks and things were breaking down. And I went in as a, just kind of a trainee and they'd shift me from place to place. And I made a full report of what was happening and tell me I got the information from the mechanics that were working in there, what, what they thought was wrong, compiled it all and sent in a good report and I got a lot of compliments, and they, and they changed the whole system, what they were doing down there. But I'd go from one of those things to another. And that was really more fun than Oak Ridge. Uh, it sounds like it would be. It would have been great fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, especially since people didn't know what you were doing. So they were, might be more forthcoming. Well, one time I'd be a private, another time I'd be a lieutenant, and then I'd be a sergeant, and just and I, people that had to take the all those uh, shots for everything, what they, they were dreaded so much that uh, I did. I had to do it three times. <laughs> so I, but I uh, overall. I just had one ambition, that was to get out. I was in <coughs> Manhattan, I mean in New York, and I was standing there looking at the window and it looked like there was some rain and clouds coming in. I was just checking the sky out. And, I, and our Empire State Building was about three blocks away. And all of a sudden I saw this plane coming straight at the Empire State Building hit dead on, and then the engines went on through the building and came out the other side. So I grabbed my camera, and took a picture of that, and all I got, of course, was smoke coming up from it. So I said, well, that might be a military plane, so I'll go out and check on it. So <clears throat> I got down, went, went over, got there, and the officers and I gave my credential, and I said, I want to see if there's any military problems over here. And he said, well, I'm going on this elevator to the 66th floor. And if you want to ride on it, that's your responsibility. I said, if you go, I'll go. So I went up to the 66th floor, looked around, I couldn't see anything. I went back and uh, didn't have to make a report because I wasn't even supposed to be there. But the next day, the reading the paper, the plane had come in and split. Part went 64 and the part went 65. All the damage was on the floor above me, and I never did even see that. <laughs> uh, wow. Huh. That shows you what a good investigator I was. <laughs>